tends to be less effective than the previous one, so that at the end, uh, what we end up with is only about 34% um, of patients live for 10 years. Now, we think that one of the reasons for this dismal outlook, uh, as shown in slide four, is that ovarian cancers are extraordinarily complex at the molecular level. They're different from patient to patient, and even sometimes within the same patient, the tumor cells can be different. And this may very well be one reason that any one drug uh, cannot be effective for everybody. And this slide is really just meant to demonstrate the, the molecular complexity that exists in, in um, ovarian cancers by showing you an aggregate view of all the chromosomes um, and where there are changes in the DNA, either amplifications or deletions, as, as shown in 500 specimens that were tested by the Cancer Genome Atlas Project and published in 2011. So you can see that there's not one region in one chromosome that's found in most patients, and that's, that really exemplifies this heterogeneity. It, it really underscores the fact that profile-directed therapy selection makes sense and that drugs need to be developed for specific tumor types. And once those drugs are available, then it's obvious that one needs to be able to comprehensively look at um, a patient's tumor in order to decide how a drug can be best matched to her for treatment purposes. So in uh, slide five, I'd like to introduce the Clarity Foundation now through its founder, who is pictured here. Uh, Laura Schauber is a scientist and ovarian cancer survivor that they had the foresight and the vision to start this foundation back in 2008 with the aim of, of bringing molecular profiling to the forefront of ovarian cancer diagnosis and treatment. And the idea is to use a profile so that patients, so that the doctors can choose therapies based on that molecular profile, uh, which will be different from patient to patient and indeed to even um, increase the probability of success for new drugs by using profiling to select, select patients that enter clinical trials. So uh, what the Clarity Foundation does in, in this slide um, is, is we are not a laboratory, so we don't do any of the tests ourselves. Oncologists and patients um, come to us for our services, and we primarily arrange to have tumor specimens sent from the hospitals to the laboratories that run a series of tests that I'll describe in a moment. Those test results are then returned to us where they're captured in a secure and privacy protected database uh, where the data are integrated, analyzed, and then the results um, provided back to the patient and the physician. Uh, we also have consultations with both physicians and patients to interpret those profiles. And the, after that, the medical team uses them to prioritize um, treatment options. Um, this profile is best used um, in the setting of recurrence, um, and that is, is exemplified in this slide where I repeat the, 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 the regular process by which patients are treated. They usually undergo surgery and then are receiving carboplatin and taxol. And as you can see, majority, 75 percent of these patients um, achieve remission but eventually recur. At recurrence, that is where a profile can be used to select the next treatment. And for patients who progress on platinum taxane therapy, there is also a use for the profile to select um, their next treatment. Um, the reason that we do not use a profile up front is that there is no way right now for us or anybody to determine who will respond to that frontline therapy. We'd like that to be available, but it's not right now. So we use the profile primarily in this recurrent um, setting. And that profile um, is used mostly to assign the, 
the possibilities for the next line chemotherapy or for chemotherapies uh, in combination with a clinical um, agent. I'm going to show you in the next slide the actual tests that are used in this profile. Not meant to go through every single one of them, except to say that there are tests, proteins that are measured um, that correlate with responses to each of the drugs that are used uh, for treatment of ovarian cancer in the recurrent setting. Those drugs include taxanes and topoisomerase inhibitors like topotecan and doxyl, et cetera. And there are also drugs that are approved in other cancers uh, and are in clinical trial in ovarian cancer that uh, we also uh, measure markers for uh, that, res that predict responses. And this entire panel is used um, to establish a prioritization scheme for physicians as to the types of drugs that might be most matched to their patient's profile. So in, in this slide, I'm going to very briefly describe the actual process and, and what it looks like. Uh, when a tumor is sent to a laboratory, it's sliced up into sections, and each section is stained for a particular protein that is a test in the panel. And this is one example of a slice of a tumor that was stained for the epidermal growth factor receptor, or EGFR, and the brown stain is the protein that's detected. The pathologist reads it. We get this information and then uh, store it in the database and also show it on a graph like what you're seeing here with a red square. The data for every single test is interpreted with respect or in the context of the other ovarian cancer patients that have been tested to date. And the choice of these markers, as well as the interpretation of the results, comes from information that is gleaned from quite a, a group of clinical research studies that have been published over the years. And this slide shows primarily the information that's known for a drug called gemcitabine, and it's an example of others that you can see on the website. Uh, gemcitabine has as its means of, of killing tumor cells uh, the mechanism that is shown in that picture in the, in the middle of the slide. But one of the, the major markers that predicts response to gemcitabine is called RRM1. It's the target of gemcitabine or ribonucleotide reductase. And when that protein is really high, the cell, um, the tumor is not very responsive to gemcitabine, so it acts as a resistance marker. So low levels of ribonucleotide reductase uh, predict response. And that's one example of how um, the analysis is done. So if you look at a case study, where we look at a full profile of the results for a particular patient who had stage 3B serous ovarian cancer at diagnosis. You see that the interpretation of the data suggested that um, she be ideally treated with either pemetrexid or with gemcitabine. And in this case, you can see at the bottom right-hand side of this slide that her physician decided at this recurrent situation to give her gemcitabine. And as of the last we knew, she was still in remission. So this is one example of a situation where the predictive biomarker, RM1, uh, indeed showed that use of a drug that correlated with the profile led to a long-lived remission. Uh, if you see on the right side, again, the scheme of her history over time, you see that she was treated with carbotaxol as is standard, even received maintenance taxanes, follow, and then recurred more than two and a half years, received carbotaxol again, including Avastin, and progressed at the end of 2009. At that time, she received doxyl 
Now this profile did not suggest that Doxel could be active. And one could always ask, had she been profiled before she received Doxel, could she have avoided the use of Doxel, which had its own toxicities and was ineffective, um, instead of um, having received that. Now, if you look at the tumor profile for the tumor at the primary stage, which you see on the left, you'll notice that that profile is somewhat different from the profile at the recurrent stage, which is the one at the right that showed pemetrexid and gemcitabine. You'll also notice that doxel was nowhere in either one of these profiles. So neither one prioritized doxel, and, and she received and failed on that drug. Yet she responded to the gemcitabine, which was prioritized by the profile of this recurrent uh, tumor specimen. So, so this information is one of, of a number of, of results that we have that suggest that the primary and recurrent tumor specimens are different. So it is very important from our perspective, as well as more people in the field today, that um, tumor profiles that are used to select therapies be done on a tumor that is relevant for the cancer that the patient is trying to treat, which, which means the recurrent um, specimen itself and, and not the primary. Hence our rationale for using that specimen. Now, I won't show you any more examples of this, but I do want to emphasize that in addition to using a profile to select for a chemotherapy treatment, the profiles can be used to select for drugs that are in clinical trials or even for combinations of, of chemotherapies with drugs in, in clinical trials. And uh, in order to do that, we have an expanded profile that, that we can arrange as well as that chemotherapy profile that I already described. And this expanded one is a next-gen sequencing of over 200 genes um, that allow us to identify alterations in these genes that are correlated and with predicted responses to a number of the drugs that are, that are listed in this um, probably hard to read slide um, for, um, for um, the trials that are ongoing in ovarian cancers as well as solid tumors. And we collect all of the information from this expansive profile in a, in a report that has on its pages uh, what's shown in this slide. You see that on the far right, the image that I've already described to you for the protein biomarker panel. We have a, another way of showing that same data in a blue graph for people who prefer to see the drugs with the, with the actual results. We also summarize the genetic alterations that are seen in the specific tumor. And on the front page, uh, we show a summary list of the drugs and agents that are uh, likely to have clinical benefit based on, on these results. And a blow up of that is shown in this slide, where you can see that in this particular case, um, some of the, most of the agents for this, for this patient tumor profile turned out to be agents that are in clinical trials. Uh, there is uh, one set of agents at the top that is used currently in ovarian cancer treatment. Now, if um, a patient's profile has many agents that are in clinical trials, we have a, a search engine on our website that can be used to identify uh, trials that are open today that may be applicable uh, for their situation so, so the physician and the patient can easily find them by searching by the drug name or by the, the class of drug that is, um, is indicated by the profile. And, and then there's an easy link to clintrials.gov for the particular trial that's, uh, that's lit up by this, by this engine. So that ends that portion of, of this talk showing the background and the types of results that we get. And 
I thought I would end um, with a few slides uh, about the actual process and uh, that, that might be of uh, particular interest to you as you're talking to patients on the phone. Um, first of all, when does it make sense to even do this kind of profiling? And these are a few of the sentences that, that have taken directly from our website uh, that, that describe the situation for a particular patient who's having their occurrence. And she's either had surgery already um, in the last year for that recurrent specimen to be um, taken, or she is planning to have some kind of surgery um, or biopsy to remove it. That these are these are obvious situations where a profiling may be appropriate. And and the last one is is if indeed uh, her her tumor her cancer has not uh, responded to frontline um, platinum taxane therapy. She's um, progressed within within six months of that last um, platinum treatment. These are all appropriate situations for profiling. And the actual nitty-gritty of what we do is described in this slide where uh, the first step is, is fairly straightforward. There's a set of, of, um, of paperwork um, activities that need to be completed uh, by usually both the physician and the patient. Some of this is an online process. Some of it is um, where the patient has to sign consent. Um, after we receive this paperwork, uh, we'll arrange for the tumor specimen to be sent to the laboratories. The CLIA certified labs complete the testing, and that can take three to four weeks, depending upon um, the tests that are ordered. And um, this is after the sample actually arrives. We receive the results, generate that report within a couple days, and then provide a consultation to the patient as well as the physician to explain the results. And um, a, a key consideration I think that's always on people's minds is how does all this get paid for? And um, our support services are, are given free of charge. So all of this effort to arrange the profiling and and create the reports that summarize and explain the information that's in this report is free. Uh, the actual costs of the profiling through the labs are covered by most, if not by many, insurance plans. Uh, and we provide some financial assistance for, for those costs uh, if, um, if a grant um, application is submitted through our website. So the forms are easily accessible uh, in the Getting Started menu on the website. I think you'll be able to find this pretty easily. Uh, there's an online background form to fill out as well as a consent and authorization for, for release of medical information form there. Um, these forms include the obvious. So we want to know the name address and physician information and some relevant medical history. Uh, we ask if the patient has it to provide a path report as well as information on, on the chemo treatments that she has already had. Uh, that doctor's office can do that uh, most readily. Uh, the consent form is essential. Uh, without that, uh, we do not, we're not able to arrange for this profiling. And the same with the release and disclosure of medical information form. So both of those forms have to be printed and signed by the patients in order for us to, to help out. Um, we need the insurance information. And if, um, if a financial assistance is desired, that form needs to be filled out as well. So this is the end of my presentation regarding what uh, we do at Clarity. I'm sure there are lots of questions um, to be asked. So I think I'm going to open it right now for that and thank you for your attention in this process. Thank you so much. Now. Thank you so much, uh, Deb and Hillary. So um, uh, if we have any, if there are any questions, feel free to either raise your hand or submit them through the questions panel. It looks like we have a question from Cheryl Karofsky, so I'm going to let you speak, Cheryl.
Sorry about that, Cheryl. <laughs> Um, so, did you have a question, Charles? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you please give me the website for Clarity Foundation again, where they would go find these forms and the information? Sure. It should have been on a couple of those slides, but it's Clarity, C-L-E-A-R-I-T-Y, Foundation, all one word, yep. dot O-R-G. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. I, I actually have a question for the for the audience. I'd be curious to know who um, has heard of this type of an approach. Um, do do any of the um, the folks who you speak to have they heard of it? Um, what are some of the questions that that oftentimes comes up? We um, most of the patients, of course, that we speak to have heard about us. They've either found us online or have heard about us from their doctor. So um, they're fairly familiar with the approach, but um, you know, would just be interested to hear any feedback on um, on the level of awareness there is for clarity and, and molecular profiling in general. Um, great. Um, we actually have a question from Andrea Herzberg. And, and I can say I can. Uh, answer the question from my perspective anyway. You know, most of the women on this line... Can, are, can you say... We can't, can't hear you very well. Okay. How about now? It's a little better. Okay. Okay. So most of the women that are on this line are informed uh, survivors who do a lot of reading or, ha or who have attended uh, conferences or survivor... Uh, you know, seminars, and so there is a fair amount of awareness about uh, clarity and molecular profiling, although there may have been some confusion at some time about assays versus molecular profiling. So do you, oh, that's a great question, Andrea, and, and we encounter that, that confusion uh, as well, and, and I think Deb's probably the best person just to address the differences between tumor assays that have been around for a little while that haven't necessarily proven to be as um, you know as useful um, compared to the genomic tumor profiling that we do. Yeah, I think um, I hope that from my presentation, uh, one thing came across clearly, and that is that. The tumor that is obtained is is already fixed in a formalin fixative and then put in paraffin, so it is not alive. There are tumor slices taken and then those are stained. Uh, each slice is stained for a different protein. So and the slices can also be used to extract DNA to look at the uh, molecular alterations that occur in the DNA, either mutations or, or changes in copy number, et cetera. So uh, the major difference between the two approaches is that the information from the assays that people talk about as live cell assays and, and this analysis, uh, which is done on tissue that's already fixed, so that it's preserved as soon as possible after excision, uh, after the surgery. Um, that's one major difference. The other one is the amount of information that is obtained, of course. Um, there's more information obtained by virtue of this profiling analysis because it's looking at uh, 200 plus genes in, in some cases and, and quite a number of proteins um, for sure. The live cell assays are, are different. Their cells are being placed onto a petri dish and, and treated with drugs to look at uh, the response of that tumor as a whole to, to um, treatment with those drugs in, a, in an out-of-the-body situation. Um, there are pros and cons of both approaches. Uh, we think that combination of information from both is 
is certainly useful in that a patient with her physician can incorporate information from, from both approaches into a treatment plan. Uh, there's no strong evidence right now that says that one is better than the other. I think that we have a preference um, in what we're doing, but that does not mean that the other approach cannot be used in a complementary way. Thank you, Deb. Andrea has a, another question, actually. I have two sure. more. One is uh, more practical, the other one is more uh, of a broad overview type question. Um, along the lines of uh, getting the tumor sample, um, we're talking about a surgery within a year or a planned surgery. Is there a potential for um, uh, getting enough cells from a drained ascites? Because we have a lot of women in that situation where they're getting their ascites drained and there are cells floating around and sometimes diagnoses are being made based on that. Um, and in a recurrent setting, if there were ascites, would that be a possibility? Absolutely. Um, great question. And in many cases, the fluids that are available from a, from a tap of, um, of abdominal ascites or even from a pleural um, effusion um, can yield sufficient cells to do this analysis. Uh, the important situation, the important criteria there is that as soon as that fluid is, um, is obtained, the cells need to be spun out of that fluid within about half an hour and then fixed in formalin uh, for the, them to be preserved appropriately for the analysis. That's generally fairly straightforward to be, um, to be performed. Most of the laboratories or radiological suites, et cetera, that are used for, for these um, fluid taps um, have the capabilities of doing that, centrifugation, et cetera. So that's fine. And, and obviously, um, the, the advantage here is that this is a, a process that's being carried out um, partly for diagnostic reason, but in also in other cases to relieve pressure um, from the buildup of fluid. And so it is a, is a necessary medical procedure. And at the same time, one can obtain information from a molecular profile. Well, that's a fascinating answer. And I, uh, I'm going to segue from that into my question about uh, gynecologic oncologist cooperation. Um, just on the basis of conferences and uh, meetings, uh, there has been historically a seeming lack of enthusiasm uh, although, uh, at, more or less, they look at it as something that's not yet ready for prime time. That's my interpretation, just solely mine. Um, can, is this changing? Is there more cooperation? Yes. Um, and before I answer that one, Andrea, I want to come back on the, uh, on the fluid sample. There is, a, uh, there is still a need in those fluid samples for there to be enough cells to profile, and generally there is, but there are occasionally cases where where the, the cell pellet is not sufficiently large for the specimen to be, um, to be profiled. So occasionally it, it's not sufficient, but most of the time it is. So with regard to acceptance, um, this is a great question again. Um, what we've seen in the five years that we've been uh, talking about and providing profiling uh, for, for patient um, physician decision-making about treatment is a, a shift from 100% patient-driven to more than 30% um, already physician-driven usage of our profile. And we'd like to obviously be at a place where 100% of the time it's going to be a physician that, that finds us first and decides to uh, do this analysis. Uh, that's not the case probably because um, it has not made um, the mainstream, um, the, I guess it's not a mainstream activity at this stage. What, what is certainly the case is that although there is a, an extraordinary amount of, of clinical research evidence that supports the use of these markers as 
predictive for the associated chemotherapies and, and other drugs. It is not yet shown in a prospective analysis that, that these markers are predictive. And what I mean by that is that there are studies done after the fact that show that if a patient has high levels of, say, RM1, the example I showed you for gemcitabine, that she does not respond to gemcitabine treatment. Uh, what would need to be done is a clinical trial where all of these protein markers are, are measured in a tumor prior to the patient receiving the drug and there would need to be a randomized study that puts pa patients into a group um, getting gemcitabine or not getting gemcitabine based on the profile in order to, to uh, prove much more robustly the, the predictive nature of them. And so you can imagine with the number of markers that are in this profile how difficult that type of study and how large that study will have to be. Um, certainly, we are collecting information ourselves uh, from every profile that, that we run and with patient consent um, have uh, their histories for responses to chemotherapy so that we are able to at least e expand the, the available um, clinical research evidence that supports the use of this profile. I hope that answers the question. It did for me. If anybody else out there needs something further, now's the time to raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> so if there are no further questions, um, I'm going to turn it back to Deb and Hillary um, to say any final comments that you want to make? Well, you know, one thing I, I would say um, is that it may take a couple minutes for everybody to digest what, what we've just said. And so it is certainly very possible for us to have either a conversation or an email exchange to answer questions that arise. Um, we're really looking forward to those questions as well as um, to any, uh, any patients that uh, need to have this type of or would like to have this type of analysis done. They can contact us directly to ask whether or not it makes sense for them. And that information is also on our website. There's a phone number that, that can be dialed to to um, to answer any specific questions anybody might have. Um, actually, as you were talking, we did get another um, person raise her, their hand. Uh, so Jane has raised her hand. I'm going to give her the opportunity to speak. Go right ahead, Jane. Jane. So. Um, Okay, I guess um, Jane has decided she doesn't want to speak. Um, so, um, so what I want you, what I, what I also wanted to know is that um, at the end of the presentation, we'll actually make audio available to everyone, and we'll send you an email of the presentation as well. One other thing that that might be helpful, and we're happy to do this. We have a mailing list um, where we send out periodic communications. Um, and, and we also have a newsletter that's oriented towards patients. So anyone who'd like to receive updates and, and further information, in addition to all the resources that are available on the website, we're happy to add you to our, to our mailing list. And, um, Thank you, you know, so much. Again, as Deb said, don't hesitate to get in touch by email. Um, Jane has actually submitted her question well, um, via the question panel. And she asks uh, about the cost if it's not covered by insurance. Great. Um, so uh, patients, uh, Clarity um, provides all of our services free of charge. 
And for patients who are uninsured or underinsured, we also provide uh, financial support to cover the cost of the test. And there is a uh, financial assistance application on the website. Uh, we just ask for a little bit of information, and um, and we've we've been able to support um, all of the patients who requested assistance for us today. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you so much. Um, Deb Zykowski and Hillary Feekston from the Clarity Foundation. We've really enjoyed hearing from you, and we really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, again, I'll, I'll be sending this presentation and um, a link to access uh, an audio file of this um, of this webinar. So thanks, thanks to everyone for joining us, and um, we look forward to talking with you again on our next webinar. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks a lot. Thank you.